Well, throughout the course of his life, Marx made a large number of incredible contributions, I would say, to human thought. But I think that arguably the most important, or one of the most important, is his approach to history. The application of his method, which we were discussing earlier on today, the method of dialectical materialism, to history, to the development of human society. And I think the reason why it is so profound only really becomes clear when we consider it in the context of how history has been approached prior to Marx and also, to be honest, after his death. Um, before Marx, the approach taken to history was effectively the approach of the, the various declarations or tales of the kings and queens of old. Perhaps you'd have people like Herodotus, who was essentially just a, uh, somebody who kept a travel diary, very fascinating history, but nothing scientific about it. There was something lacking, and that was precisely a scientific method. And that's doubly interesting when you consider the fact that Marx didn't, invent materialism. Materialism as a, as, as a philosophical standpoint existed long before Marx, actually. But as Plekhanov, who's considered the father of Russian Marxism, himself pointed out, he said, the materialist conception of nature is still not the materialist conception of history. The materialists of the last century, referring to the 18th century, saw history with the eyes of idealists and very naive idealists at that. Insofar as they dealt with the history of human societies, they tried to explain it by the history of thought. And this is something that didn't die away after Marx um, made his, uh, put forward his ideas and after Marx's death. In fact, actually, today, as we speak, in universities and in history books and on historical programmes on TV, there are really two main trends of what I would call bourgeois history. The first is that, in reality, history one way or another, has always been this way. There's always been some form of oppression, for example, some form of rulership, some form of inequality and exploitation. Um, or that history is in reality just the kind of cultural development towards what we have now. I'm sure many, of, if not all of you, are familiar with Francis Fukuyama's idea of the end of history, which followed the collapse of the Soviet Union. That idea, philosophically speaking, in terms of the development of history, is that liberal Western democratic values are the end state of human society. And that really the kind of course of history is this process of enlightenment towards um, this final state. There's that idea which I suppose is similar to Whig history of the past. But then there's an also, I would say, even more reactionary and more pernicious idea, which is linked to the philosophy of postmodernism, which is essentially that, as Alan was discussing this morning, there is no progress. I would say the postmodernist approach to history is not summed up best by a postmodernist philosopher or historian, but rather by Henry Ford, the industrial tycoon in America in the 1920s, who described history as one damn thing after another. The idea that you could have any connection between these events, that you could offer any kind of systematic or scientific approach to explaining not just the hows, wheres, and wife, uh, um, the hows, wheres, and, and whats, but also the fundamental question of why things have happened as they do is considered in itself just a, a ridiculous endeavour. Now, this is something that also gripped the minds of the materialists of the 18th century. They thought, uh, Alan this morning was talking about this separation between the body that the materialists such as Descartes, for example, considered to be just a machine, but then you had a strange contradiction that you had this body as the machine, but how do you explain the ghost in the machine, as they thought of it? How do you explain the soul? And so we had this dualism between the material and the spiritual. The approach, the bourgeois approach to history is effectively a continuation of that, but it, it kind of expanded onto the scale of human society as a whole. Yes, the natural world can be dis uh, explained by scientific material laws and that there is objectivity to nature. However, because we as human beings are conscious and human society is therefore, by definition, a collection of conscious beings, it can't follow those laws. That The human psyche, if you like, has placed us outside of nature and that human society therefore either it has no relation to the material world whatsoever, or it has no um, possible explanation itself. 
And this, this idea, as I already mentioned, is very, very common. One very popular book about history, uh, it marks itself as a popular science book that some of you may have read, many of my friends have read it, is a book called Sapiens by um, a fellow called Yuval Harari. And I'd, I've taken this just as a, sm a short example of what I mean by the fact that modern bourgeois history today is still burdened by this dualism. He says, since large-scale human cooperation is based on myths, the way people cooperate can be altered by changing the myths, by telling different stories. So history is basically the, the history, the course of development of different ideas. And if people start having different ideas, then society changes accordingly. Now, we would say that's idealism, that the materialism of these kind of original 18th century materialists and their kind of, I, I don't know, modern descendants is an incomplete idealism. And what Marx contributed, which no one up until that point had done, was he was the first person to place the evolution of human society on a scientific material basis. And I'd like to talk a bit about how he did it. He, um, he was a big fan of Charles Darwin. Marx himself, he, he lived through a, religi uh, religious, a scientific revolution in his lifetime. And I don't think it's any coincidence that Marx's very famous preface to a contribution to the critique of uh, political economy actually came out in exactly the same year as uh, Darwin's Origin of the Species in 1859. And I think Engels sums this up best, Marx's relationship to Darwin, in his speech that he gave at Marx's graveside after Marx's death, obviously. He said, just as Darwin discovered the law of development of organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of development of human society. The simple fact, hitherto concealed by an overgrowth of ideology, that mankind must have first of all eat, drink, have shelter and clothing before it can pursue politics, science, art, religion, etc. And Marx himself explains in Capital, he talks about um, labour. It's all very well saying, oh, well, OK, we're going to take a scientific approach to history. We're going to try and root it in material conditions. Which? How are we going to do that? And what Marx did is rather than rooting the development of history in the brains of men and women, he rooted it in their labour. If you like, rooted it in the hand rather than the head. In Capital Volume 1, he says, Labour, then, as the creator of use values, as useful labour, is a condition of human existence, which is independent of all forms of society, by which he means it's just a permanent um, state of, uh, of our existence, it is an eternal natural necessity which mediates the metabolism between man and nature and therefore human life itself. So just as Darwin traced the evolution and development of the species of this planet based on their relationship with the natural world and their surroundings, Marx did something similar, mediated by this labour. And what's interesting is this, this um, if you like, the, the transference of, of history from the, from the head to the hand is something that's actually been confirmed by more recent scientific studies. It's, it's kind of an interesting tangent to briefly go into that um, Engels, Marx's lifelong collaborator, predicted and he, he hypothesized that actually it was the development, the evolution, the physical evolution of the hand, the preci precision grip which led and allowed for the development of the human brain and the very high level of consciousness of, uh, of human beings. At that time that wasn't the accepted point of view. Further research, more recent scientific studies have confirmed precisely that. So this idea of, of, of labour being the primary kind of uh, the basis of the development of human society is something also confirmed in the natural world. But some certain very important conclusions flow from this, because simply saying it is the production of the necessities of life and labour which is the base of human society, that is our starting point for a materialist, a consistently materialist approach to history. But we have to go a little further than that, and I think one of the most important um, quotations that I can offer in terms of Marx's approach to history comes from his preface to a contribution to the critique of political economy. Um, and I, I will quote it in full. It's slightly long, quite dense, but we can unpack these ideas over the course of this session. In the social production of their existence, men inevitably enter into definite relations which are independent of their will, namely relations of production appropriate to a given stage in the development of their material forces of production. The totality of these relations of production constitute the economic structure of society. The real foundation on which arises a legal and political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political and intellectual life. And this famous line, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. Now there's a lot of ideas in this paragraph. The first one to start with, which is extremely important, that when we talk about labour, we're necessarily, in every 
every case talking about, about a social process. The interaction, and we were discussing dialectics earlier, the, inter the dialectical relationship between humanity and the natural world is one that takes place in a social way. All forms of human society are based on some level of cooperation, interaction and inter interdependency between different individuals. And so necessarily at any given stage of the development of productive forces, by which it means the, um, the instruments, technology, techniques, uh, the means by which we extract our necessities of life from the natural world, that necessarily brings people together in some form of produ productive relations, which then the totality of these relations act upon the individuals in society themselves, almost like a natural force. When we're born into a society, when we're born into capitalism, for example, we can't simply think, well, this doesn't seem like a very good idea, let's live a different way. It, it forces it, it imposes itself on us as if it were the natural world. And this is something that's confused people in the past and still continues to confuse people. I mentioned that quote from Harari. Marx actually, in Capital, in chapter two of Capital, responds to these ideas 150 years before they're put out. He says, it's also declared that these characteristics, by which he's referring to the different features of society, are the arbitrary product of human reflection. This was the kind of explanation favored by the 18th century. In this way, the Enlightenment endeavored, at least temporarily, to remove the appearance of strangeness from the mysterious shapes assumed by human relations whose origins they were unable to decipher. So one thing to, uh, an important thing to understand at all points when we're talking about the Marxist approach to, approach to history is it's one rooted in the relations between people. And we consider relations to be a real thing. That the, the real and the material is not simply the kind of physical objects, the tangible reality that we can see, hear, feel, whatever. It's also the relations between those things. Gravity is real. But it is ultimately a relation between things rather than a, you know, a physical entity itself. And you can see this in the kind of economic and social relations that form our society. And there's another aspect to this, which I've already mentioned, which is the dialectical aspect. I've concentrated on the kind of materialist basis of the Marxist approach to history. But it is also a dialectical theory, which is very important. This isn't a secondary feature of the theory. Because how do things develop? Dialectically, they, dial, uh, they develop, as um, Alan was explaining, through a process of constant and inevitable change. But not only change, we're not talking about a, a gradual, easy, easy transition from one from the lower to the higher, but one that is contradictory, one that is rooted in contradiction, and one which proceeds in leaps and bounds, in, in revolutions essentially. And we can see its reflection in human society itself. Let's take uh, one very common explanation of human history, which is this idea of human nature. I'm sure you've all encountered it. Many of you, if, if you find yourselves arguing for the, you know, the ideas of socialism, for example, someone will say, well, no, that can't work because it's against human nature. And this idea of something, uh, of human nature as being a fixed and eternal state is something that we reject as dialectical materialists. That's something abstract and ultimately unreal. That just as uh, Alan was talking about Heraclitus, just as he said everything is and is not, humanity and human nature, uh, nature is something that's in a constant process of change and something actually that reflects our environment and our conditions. To take possibly the most um, fundamental example of this is in the way we live. Today, it's considered perfectly normal, it's con considered effectively human nature that we live a certain way, that we live in houses, in settled communities, for example, and that we have to work for someone else. This is something, a state of existence which has admittedly existed for thousands of years, but it has not existed for the sum total of humanity's existence, whether we take in the form of Homo sapiens or whether we take it in all of the different um, human species. In reality, actually, the the earliest human societies, based on what anthropological, archaeological studies we have, would have had no notion whatsoever of living in a permanent, settled place, living in the same place your entire life, or even of private property, or of working for someone else in order to, say, earn a wage. These would have been utterly alien notions to the people living at this time. And by this time, I mean not, relatively speaking, very long ago, over 10,000 years ago. In fact, for the vast majority of humanity's existence, these ideas would have been completely, complete, considered complete nonsense, utterly alien ideas. However, as we know, that's not the case anymore. 
Now, the approach of many um, scholars, I suppose, has been to, to struggle with this. If you take an abstract approach to human nature, if human nature must be fixed, and I don't simply mean humanity's biological nature, which itself actually isn't completely fixed, but in terms of our social nature, if it has to be one thing or another, for example, if we have to, if the monogamous, monogamous family is something coded into our DNA, it becomes very, very difficult to explain how in the past there is plenty of evidence for that not being the case. And so usually what we get is a romanticization of one or the other. Either pre, human, humans pre, humanity's prehistory, as it's often referred to, is a state of the, you know, the most black ignorance and, and uh, barbarism, and that what was necessary was for people to finally start having proper ideas about settling down, marrying, forcing women into the marriage contract, things like that. And that's when we become civilized and rise, raise ourselves out of this barbarism. But then you've got the other kind of caricature, which is that life prior to class society and prior to urban settlement was this kind of Garden of Eden situation. Alan was talking about the Garden of Eden, where everything was basically provided and we lived in complete harmony and equality and everything was perfect. But then almost this cataclysm came from the sky, almost this act of original sin. And we were forced, men were forced to work the land and women were forced to go through the agony of childbirth. Both of these have more religious than scientific merit, in my opinion. In reality, human nature has changed fundamentally over the years. And what has driven that change, in the last analysis, we're not talking about a purely mechanical relationship that every single um, innovation in the means of production automatically produces some new idea and new form of society. Far from it. But that underlying this process was a fundamental change in the means of production. And to just f pursue this, um, Gordon Child, a very famous archaeologist, and himself a Marxist, coined a term that you may well be familiar with, the Neolithic Revolution. Neolithic, it means new stone, new stone age, and of course revolution is referring to this revolutionary process in which um, nomadic hunter-gatherer communities that did not rely on agriculture and working the land or the domestication of animals suddenly, uh, and by suddenly I, I mean not in one moment, but over a relatively short pro uh, period, settled and started living in a way that would have been considered absolutely absurd. In the same way that today, when we talk about the possibility of living without private property or without class oppression, people say, but it's always been like this. What are you talking about? I can imagine that thousands and thousands of years ago, tens of, tens, uh, 10, years ago 10,000 years ago, that when somebody suggested, obviously I can't claim that this conversation actually took place. Something like it must have taken place at some point, surely. When someone said, well, why don't we... Why don't we um, harvest these crops and stay in the same place on a permanent or semi-permanent basis? There, I'm sure, will have been people in the society who would say, what are you talking about? We've never done that. We've always moved around. Why on earth would we want to stay in the same place? But these, uh, these revolutionary ideas, if you like, were reflecting a change in the material basis. And that change came with the domestication of plants and animals, with the coming of agriculture. Prior to this innovation, if you like, the ownership of land, for example, would have been a complete nonsense. Why would you have private ownership of a piece of land that you can't cultivate? If you can't produce a surplus, then the whole notion of ownership of, of land in particular doesn't make sense. It is only once you have the beginnings of agriculture that notions of ownership, and even then, private ownership, as in one single individual owning a plot of land, doesn't come in for much, much later. But here we see very important social relations coming into being as a result of the changes in the means of production. And from from this, there then comes even more dramatic results. For the first time in history, the, this production of a regular, reliable surplus, which didn't take place overnight, but did eventually take place, it gives rise to this surplus from which other processes start to come about. Um, Aristotle, actually, the, you know, the ancients had some kind of notion of this. Aristotle said that man be begins to philosophize when his needs of life are catered for, are provided. What that means is the first kind of uh, you know, settled civilizations, and incidentally, I, I forgot to mention, the beginning of these urban civilizations, like the Mesopotamian city-states, are themselves another revolution. Gordon Child also termed, uh, coined the term the urban revolution, that again, this development of the surplus, this development of the means of production, for example, the cultivation of the former you know, swamps, really, of southern Mesopotamia, now Iraq, gave basis to a surplus great enough to sustain an entire class of people who do not work the land. At no point do they have to work the land. Instead, they devoted their time to other things. They devoted their time, yes, to religion, to administration, to astrology. And the ancient Greeks, actually, 
they, uh, the, the, again, they identified this process. Um, they saw the first civilization on Earth, the original civilization, as ancient Egypt. And Aristotle explained that mathematics and astrology were discovered in Egypt as opposed to elsewhere because the priest class didn't have to work. And this raises a very profound conclusion for Marxists and for history itself, I would say, that you see the origins of the class struggle, so first of all, not as something eternal and everlasting and a product of human nature itself, which on its own means nothing, but actually as a product of the development of the means of, product, of the means of production and the splitting of society into classes, to put it simply, of a class of those who produce and a class of those who appropriate that uh, surplus product. That gives root to all kinds of things. It gives root, yes, to um, the, uh, the development of the state, Engels explained, based on uh, also Marx's work in relation to uh, the anthropology of the time, he explained that the, the state is not something that's everlasting and eternal, that kingship is not some uh, inbuilt part of human nature. He explains, and this is, I'm quoting from his, his book on the family, the origin of the family, private property and the state. Society at a certain stage of development is the admission that this society has become entangled in an um, insoluble, insoluble contradiction with itself, that it's split into irreconcilable antagonisms which it is powerless to dispel, but in order that these antagonisms, these classes with conflicting economic interests, might not consume themselves in society in fruitless struggle, it became necessary to have a power, seemingly standing above society, that would alleviate the conflict and keep it within the bounds of order. And this power, arisen out of society but placing itself above it, and alienating itself more and more from it, is the state. And we can see this in the fact that city-states, kings, are themselves socially evolved things. There is very little, if any, evidence for any kings whatsoever prior to about 3000 BC, give or take. All of a sudden, you have a period, speaking specifically of Mesopotamia, uh, but this process can be seen elsewhere, you have a process where all of a sudden you have a period of crisis for a couple of hundred years, and following that, all of a sudden you've got kings all over the shop. You've got kings popping up like mushrooms in the night, claiming themselves to be the first and everlasting kings. You have states, armed bodies of men that prior to that hadn't, been ex uh, hadn't existed. Prior to that, yes, you had armed people, but it was usually the community itself, the village commune, for example. This is a, a dramatic change. It's a revolution, essentially, in the way that society was organised. And this, ultimately, Lenin explained that the class struggle, the way that we define the class struggle, is over the, the struggle over the surplus that is being produced. That is ultimately, in the broad sense, what the class struggle is about. But after this class struggle evolves, as Marx explains, it becomes the motor force of history. It becomes, um, as he puts in the Communist Manifesto, the history of all hitherto ex existing society is the history of class struggles. Those of you who've read the manifesto will notice there's a little footnote after that line where Engels, after the event, has come back in, uh, come in and said actually what he meant is written history because prior to that you did not have class society, you did not have a state. Writing History itself, the way we understand and approach history, is itself a product of the class struggle. The origin of writing comes through the development of this surplus of tra trade and exchange. The first ever form of writing, if you can call it that really, is symbols to denote things like cattle, sheep, just little tokens that uh, would imprint on a piece of clay the picture of a sheep, for example. Eventually, these pictures became what you'd call a pictographic script. So they started to denote, basically, people were drawing the things that they wanted to communicate. Eventually, that became increasingly abstract, and this process was being under, underpinned by development of trade, commerce, and the development of production. Eventually, these abstract symbols became, um, in Mesopotamia, the, um, the uh, cuneiform script, that gave birth to things like the Epic of Gilgamesh. Alan mentioned that the Genesis comes from a Babylonian story. That was written in that script. The Code of Laws of Hammurabi, that arguably the first constitution on earth, that is, again, a product of that script. It came from, essentially, the accounting practices of a bunch of temple bureaucrats in what is now Iraq. It's not nearly as romantic as people would uh, have you to understand. In reality, the accountant and the poet historically have the same mother, and that mother is the development of production and the development of a surplus. This is a product of the class struggle in, in its ancient state. Religion, we discussed religion in the morning session. I won't, um, I won't go into detail on that, but not only does Marxism kind of, if you like, it puts religion in its place in terms of material basis, but it can actually offer insight into why is it that we have these different religious revolutions, these different religious sects that split off from each other? Why is it that the Protestant heresy developed where and when it did? 
as opposed to you know, 500 years before? These questions can only be asked, uh, um, well, they can be asked on many bases, but they can only be answered satisfactorily on the basis of a material understanding of society. It is not a coincidence that uh, Protestant, the first forms of Protestantism, Protestantism, for example, arose in the towns in the towns where the town dwellers, also known in French as bourgeois, lived. It was a class question. It was the emergence of the kind of the very first bourgeois that was linked to this religious, this new religious understanding that was really not just a reaction against uh, the kind of dogma of the Catholic Church, but against the social feudal relations that existed in that society at that time. Once we unlock this, we can actually start to understand history as a process and not, as Henry Ford said, as one th damn thing after another. But there's a very important aspect to this. I've, so far I've talked about the evolution of society being un underpinned by the evolution of the productive forces, or the development of the productive forces. But it's important for us to dwell on how exactly does that take place. Does it take place in a slow, gradual um, fashion? And as I, as I was talking about earlier, does the invention of some new technique or form of technology automatically, in a mechanical way, change society? That's absolutely not the case. If that were the case, then history would probably be a lot more of a, a straightforward and peaceful process than it actually has been. In fact, actually, history is riven with contradictions. Contradictions which themselves have given birth to not only step forward, but steps back. Progress is itself, and we as Marxists do not deny progress at all, but we do accept that co progress is contradictory, and it's possible to have steps back as well as steps forward. How do we explain that? If society is rooted in the material conditions, in this process of labour, how can we explain this? And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, labour is a social process. That This process of labour itself gives birth to social relations, different ways of doing things, and or social orders. Once that kind of social framework, this economic base of society is crystallised, and on top of it, various institutions like the state, like the family structure, which has evolved and changed over time. These things become a rigid block, if you like. Marx uses the word a fetter, eventually on the self-same production, uh, sorry, development of these productive forces. In other words, this is another dialectical idea, that that which is progressive at one point later becomes reactionary, it later becomes a fetter, a drag on development. This is a very common idea in life, the idea that all that is born is eventually destined to die, and that in, over the course of our lives you have, have a growing up, you have a, a vigorous period of youth, and eventually you have a decline. It's just a natural part of life, and eventually death. You see these in societies. But, uh, and Marx says in the Communist Manifesto that eventually these revolutions, when the, sorry, the, where these relations, when these societies are no longer able, to, able in the last analysis to develop the productive forces, to push society forward, they enter into a period of crises and revolutions. And this is a very important conclusion for us to ponder because I would say we are living in, in just a period such as that. We are living in a period of a society, of social relations, which actually become a fetter on the development of future society. And in, as a result of that, they're entering into crises and, and periods of revolution. One example, uh, so Marx drew these conclusions by looking at the evolution of capitalism itself. He looked at how capitalism was born within the womb, if you like, of feudal society, and then eventually had to break out and came into conflict with the kind of the feudal relations which had themselves become fetters. You may remember if you've read the Communist Manifesto, he says the feudal relations of property became no longer compatible with the already developed productive forces. They became so many fetters, they had to be burst asunder, they were burst asunder. And we can see this, I would say, today. We have today a society in which the total potential productive forces that exist today, not on the basis of future society or technology, but right now, is enough, I'm told, to feed as many as 10 billion people. But Prince William, on the birth of his third child, by the way, as a coincidence, said that the world is overpopulated. We have a situation, one of the comrades early on today spoke about the Oxfam study and other studies that pointed to the fact that, what was it, 45 individuals own as much as 3.5 billion. You have a concentration of wealth on an enormous scale. You have the development of huge monopolies, the development of, an enorm of enormous banks who effectively control the entire economy. This is coming into conflict with the fact that, okay, you have what <coughs> Marxists would call social production. None of us produce on a purely individual basis. All of us are dependent on the labour of everyone else, particularly in this society.
And yet at the same time, the wealth, the surplus of this uh, social labour is appropriated on an individual basis. And so you have the absurdity of, for example, climate change, something that requires a global response. You have a global economy, something that requires a planned global response. And yet the individual nation states themselves, things that are historically evolved as a result of the development of capitalism, are holding it back. You have, for example, the, the, um, the uh, phenomenon of scientists being, being climate change deniers because various companies, such as oil companies, are paying them off, or politicians like Donald Trump. This is a sign, I would say, of a, of a society in really desperate decline. And yet it's not all doom and gloom. I don't want you to think that uh, it's, it's, uh, we're all doomed, because... History, as I already mentioned, develops in a contradictory way. It's a two-sided process because just as within the womb of feudalism, a new form of society, of capitalist society, developed and came into conflict with that, so too the history of the last 100, 200 years of capitalism is one of a new class coming into being and coming into conflict with these relations, with these fetters of capitalist society. That's the working class. This is actually why Marxists put so much importance and emphasis on the role of the working class in society. It's not um, as a result of romanticism. We don't, we, don't, thank you. we don't look at the working class as the progressive class in society because it's oppressed, which it is, or because it's exploited, which it is, but because in their hands, the workers, this class which it, it really has not existed before in history, they in some cases literally hold in their hands the levers of production. They already have the capability to control and run society. They already produce the wealth of society. And purely through their own kind of experience of the capitalist system, they come together, they organise, for example, on a trade union basis, they organise on a political basis, and they raise ideas coming from their movement, not coming simply from Marx or, or, or any other um, you know, great intellectual, but actually from the logic of their own struggle, they put forward the same demands that we put forward. They put forward socialist, uh, socialist demands. A great example of that is the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune was not suddenly sprung on society by Marxists. It wasn't even led by Marxists. It was an uprising of the working class, which gave, brought into being the first ever worker state in history. And Marx actually took, exp um, took an example from that, not the other way around. It's an interesting thing to, to, to ponder, and I think it's important to remember that that is the way the Marxist theory works. This is also why we need to, we Marxists study in detail the science of revolution, if you like, and we study the history of the working class in detail. Again, not out of some kind of fetish or because we think it's romantic, but because in that is the collective experience of the workers as they fight to overthrow this old, decrepit society. And if we, as Marxists, come to the conclusion that it must, it has become these relations need to be burst asunder, to quote from the manifesto again, then we need to analyse scientifically the process by which that will come into being. There's one more point about how this can come, to, come into being which I should, uh, I should mention. There is an idea, a very common idea, that history, the movement of history is spurred by great individuals. Great men or women, usually men, the way the story is told, come onto the scene and then by some great acts, for example, if they're a king, they'll make some great acts of legislation or if they're a great warrior or some great religious figure and history moves in their train. Well, we as Marxists don't believe that that's how it works. We actually think that great men are produced by history rather than the other way around. Again, a great example of this, you can go back to the very, very ancient times. Do you know who the first great man in history ever was, at least based on written records? He was a guy called Alulim. He's the first king listed on the Sumerian king list. This is something from 5,000 years ago. And he apparently, when he became king, he apparently ruled for 28,800 years. So a great advert there for the Mesopotamian diet. <laughs> now, we don't have any evidence that he ever existed, but we do have evidence that one of these, the first ever king that we know or are confident that did exist is a guy called En Mebaragesi, and he's dated to about 2,600 years. He wasn't quite as um, long-lived as Alulim. He apparently just ruled for 900 years. F there are two conclusions that we can draw from this. The first one is that ever since these institutions of kingship and of great men have emerged, which have not existed for all time, there has been a vested interest in you like of saying it's always been like this. It's been like this for 30,000 years. How can you get rid of kings? It's been like this for longer than agriculture existed. Um, the, another conclusion from that is that these, these great men are themselves the products of history. I mentioned that 
prior to the evolution of states about 5,000 years ago, there was no record. You can't even find statues of identifiable indiv individuals. There were no individuals in history, let alone great individuals. All of a sudden, it is with the development of class society, with an oppressor class, and with armed bodies of men, which require a leader, that all of a sudden these all-powerful great individuals come into play. Very, very, relatively speaking, late on in human history. That should give us an indication of the real role of individuals. One, one other example, and there are many, perhaps we can discuss them in the discussion itself, Napoleon. There are more books written about Napoleon Bonaparte than any other figure in world history. I'm not sure why, to be honest. I mean, it's an interesting story, but why him? Napoleon Bonaparte, about two days before the coup which brought him to power, fell off his horse. And he was knocked out cold. He was in a comatose state for a couple of days, and they weren't sure he was going to make it. Now, I ask you, what do you think would have happened if he'd never come out of that coma? If he'd fallen off his horse, and that would have been the end of Napoleon Bonaparte? Do we think that the revolution, um, Russian, Rev uh, Russian Revolution, French Revolution, would have continued in exactly the way it was going? Or do you not think that history, if you like, and the process that was going on in French society at that time would have found another Napoleon? Maybe that sec other Napoleon wouldn't have been as good. We don't know. Every individual has their own individual characteristics. We're not saying that you can't have talented people who play enormous roles in the process. But do we really think that the phenomenon that we call Bonapartism would not have emerged simply because one man fell off his horse? That seems to me to be quite an arbitrary view of the human um, historical process. Let's take one other great figure. We as Marxists, or I certainly as a Marxist, think a great deal of Lenin. I think he's a great man. Do I think that the history of Russia was determined by the force of his character? No, I don't. I think he played an extremely important role. I don't think the seizure of power in October would have taken place without Lenin and Trotsky. But these same great individuals that in this period of history, at this pinnacle of the class struggle, if you like, when all the forces in history are, are laid bare for that relatively brief window, those same people that were able to tip the balance, if you like, to play that all-important role, later on, when the same process has gone into reverse, when you enter into a process of an ebb of the masses, which it's the masses which give the great individuals power. It's the class struggle that give these great individuals power. When the masses start to recede and you enter into a period of counter-revolution in Russia, those same individuals, someone as great as Lenin, finds himself saying, he literally said, it feels like being in a car which is effectively driving itself. The driver does not have full control over the steering wheel. He was referring to the growing and increasingly confident bureaucracy of the Soviet Union. So this great man on one hand was able to make history and the other was incapable of doing it. How do we explain this? It's because of the historical process itself. It's because of the, the role of the working class and of the masses. Does that therefore mean, and there's, some, there's a conclusion that I want to dispel that apparently flows from this, that therefore because we reject the idea of great individuals making history for us, that therefore we, don't say, we say that the individual has no role whatsoever to play in history, that basically there is no human agency, and we take almost a nihilistic or fatalistic perspective that, well, society is going to develop as it develops, either it will be good or bad, there's nothing we can do about it, we may as well just wait to find out. That clearly isn't what Marx thought. Later on, we're going to have a session about what kind of activity Marx dedicated himself to. I don't think if that was his philosophy, if that was his attitude to history, he would have bothered, to be honest. I don't think he would have gone to the effort of founding the First International and spending years rowing with Bakunin, for example, or Bakunin even, sorry. I, I, I think he would have written his great works, buried in the garden, in the garden with a note saying, I told you so, and left it at that and led a cushy life as a professor. Why not, if, if it's going to happen anyway? Instead, he devoted his life to revolutionary struggle. That suggests to me that he did believe in a certain uh, element of individual agency. And he also gave a huge role to consciousness. Why is that? Why would a materialist give a huge role to consciousness? And it's based on a dialectical understanding of what consciousness is. Yes, our consciousness reflects the real material world around us, but it is, in, in that sense, it's secondary. The material world must always be primary, but it can act back on the material world. Marx actually said that ideas themselves have or can have a material force, but only when they grip the minds of the masses. And for him, that was the importance of um, working class consciousness. Class consciousness, again, it wasn't simply a romantic or poetic idea. It is the, coming, the becoming aware, not only of the working class's place in society, the fact it's exploited, but then also coming to terms with the fact that it is capable of taking society and the economy into its hands and planning it and transforming society from a cap capitalist to a working class socialist basis. That consciousness for Marx, it didn't come down, it didn't simply happen by us like prophets coming down and telling people you're oppressed, you need to rise up. There have been plenty of people who've said that in history, but through a process of struggle, and it's through that process of struggle, but also 
um, crystallizing all of this collective experience, the history of working class struggle, that we can actually make this a reality. And for that, you also require organization. How do ideas attain material force? It's all well and good for us to agree on something, but to agree on an idea and then just disperse and go about our lives will not give it any material force whatsoever. We have to organize. In that sense, the party is like the, it's like the crystallized form of the consciousness we're talking about. You see here the relationship between the material and the idea. And just to kind of conclude, if uh, a great Marxist, Ted Grant, once said that the brain is matter made aware of itself, that human consciousness is matter, it can't be made of anything else, that has become self-aware. Well, I would say that the Marxist view of history is class made aware of itself. And that gives us a certain, uh, I think it's a very enlightening concept, but also it, it also has a certain, it gives a certain sense of duty, I would say. Revolution lies at the heart of the Marxist view of history. But I, was, I must say, when I've talked a lot about revolutions, I've talked about the Neolithic Revolution, I've talked about the French Revolution, but actually the revolution that we're fighting for is a little bit different from these. It's not completely divorced, it, it plays the same role in history. But these revolutions, even the French Revolution, took place, in a, if, you, if you like, a best on a, on a semi-conscious level. I think the, the people who were fighting for these ideas like liberty, fraternity, equality, they were espousing kind of idealised versions of of the same capitalist relations or bourgeois relations that would eventually come into being. But they didn't literally see it as we are a class overthrowing a defunct social system. That idea didn't exist anymore. Likewise, during the time of the Neolithic Revolution, I very much doubt people were thinking about it in those terms. However, this re the socialist revolution, the overthrow of capitalism as a global system by a global class, the working class, it requires the conscious seizure of power by the workers and the conscious transformation of human society. That relates back to what Allen was saying about Engels' quote that it would be a transition from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. For Engels, consciousness came through experience. It came through learning about the laws which determine our existence and through that being able to move and, and change our own fate. Another quote that I'd like to bring forward is Archimedes famously said, if you give him a lever and a place to stand, then he'll move the earth. I would say that the Marxist view of history is our lever. It's the lever of the working class to understand its place in the world, to understand how the work, world works and according to, accordingly to move it to move it to its will and to change society in its own image. And finally, I would just like to end on the words of the great man himself, Karl Marx, that the philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. Thank you.